Nehemiah chapter 2 and chapter 3. Nehemiah chapter 2 and chapter 3. And I want to just talk about what, we've been going through the series of Nehemiah, and I want to talk about what uh, chapter 3 really shows us and what we can really see here. So let me, let me go like this. Cassie and I, we, we're coming up on our one-year anniversary in October. One-year anniversary, right, of, of married, wedded bliss. For her, okay? This has been a blessing for her more than anything. I, I, I know you're sitting there thinking, man, to be married to Matt Barnett, that must be amazing. It is. I know. It, it's, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great time. But one of the things that I'm seeing and one of the things that I've started to notice is when we, got, when we started to make the plans to get married, we, in July, bought a house. And so when we bought our house, she moved in there, and I waited till um, I got married to, to move into that house. But when I moved in there... One of the things I noticed is Cassie has her own style, all right? She has what she likes our house to look like. So she said, anything you want in the house, we'll go pick out decorations. Well, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't really want to go pick out decorations, all right? That's not my thing. But she decided she was going to go pick out the decorations, and, and she could do whatever she wanted to do. And so when we got married, I came into the house, we moved all our stuff in together, and I looked in my living room, and I thought, yeah, this has definitely been decorated by a woman, all right? This is definitely her, this is definitely her house. So in her, in her graciousness, she gave me one little area of my living room, which is, which is, which is great. Um, and so she has all these, like, these things on the wall that have this Bible scripture and all this kind of stuff. And I have this one little spot in my living room. This one little thing that I can call my own, and, and, it, and it's, it's next to our engagement pictures, it's next to our pictures of Moo, it, it, it's this right here, it's a, it's a signed autographed picture of Ric Flair, okay, that is my, my prized possession, that is what I, I am so proud of. And learning about our home and learning about moving in together, I remember the days before I was married, I lived with, with Neil, and Neil and I, when we, when we lived together, I, I could move in about roughly 5.6 seconds, anytime I needed to, okay? So we lived in a house that if a tornado would come through, it would tear the thing in half. And so we would hear the sirens going off, I'd get my wrestling DVDs, my picture of Ric Flair, and I'd walk out the door and I was gone, okay? I could be off the grid just like that. It was easy for me. But moving in with Cassie and, and, and experiencing life together, we found out what our home was going to be like. The way Cassie liked it, really what I liked about my home, we, we kind of came together in our, in our common interests. See, I love my house. It's, it's my place. It's my place to relax, my place to get away, my place to be able to just kind of be there. When everything around me is crazy, it's where I go. I, like, I, I'm such a homebody. I really don't like to be away from my home for many days at all because that's... I just like to be home. And there's something about your house that's just yours, that you can, it, you can, I, you can have your identity in it, you can have your, your, your greatest memories there. That's, that's what your home is about. That's what my home is about. And when you go to Nehemiah chapter 2, this is what you're seeing. See, in Nehemiah, they, they've had this, the wall, their city, Jerusalem, destroyed, and they're getting to come back and rebuild it. And sometimes when we look at the scripture, we can really think, man, they're just trying to rebuild a bunch of walls, rebuild a bunch of cities. But really what they're trying to rebuild is their lives. They're trying to re it's not about walls. They're trying to rebuild their own lives, their identity, who they are. And so in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 17, it says this. Then I said to them, you see the troubles we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, and we'll no longer be in disgrace. Again, Jerusalem was the pride. It was where they went to worship together. It's where they grew up. It's where their children grew up. It's their identity. It's who they are. And like I said, this isn't, Nehemiah is not necessarily a story of building broken walls. It's really a story of building their broken lives. And if I can be honest with you today, all of us, the person you're sitting next to, in front of, behind, all of us are going to run into a time in our life where the unexpected happens where you didn't plan for it, but something terrible happens in your life. You didn't choose it, you didn't want it to happen, but it, but it happens. And I know you came to church on Labor Day and you're ready for a happy, warm sermon, and I, and I hope you get that, but I have to be truthful with you. There's gonna be dark days in your life. And so what do we do with those dark days? How do you handle those dark days. What I want you to know today is sometimes God has to break us in order to rebuild us into who he's calling us to be. And, and what you really need to hear there is that sometimes when God breaks you, 
When everything around you falls apart, it's not because God's punishing you or because he's mad at you. Actually, the Bible says he disciplines those that he loves. He's trying to get something out of you. Some of you guys right now, you're going through a tough time, and maybe God's trying to show you something in the middle of this season. It's not your fault. He's just trying to show you something in this season. Are you guys still with me today? We good? And so in Nehemiah chapter 3, we're going to talk about the rebuilding of the walls and really the rebuilding of their lives. I'm going to be honest with you. You're not going to see a lot of sermons preached on Nehemiah chapter 3. You're not going to see a lot of books written on Nehemiah chapter 3. At this point, I want to thank Pastor Brent for letting me preach this chapter because it's, it's, it's a crazy chapter. You're going to see a lot of unpronounceable names versus a bunch of unpronounceable names over and over and over and over. And the whole chapter is this person worked next to this person, and this person worked next to this person, and this person worked next to this person. It's really a beautiful picture of the gospel. It's really a beautiful picture of the church itself, that we come together, we work together for one common good, one common interest. But Nehemiah chapter 3 is a big, long chapter of a bunch of names, but there's more truth underneath than we could probably even understand. And so today, I want to talk about Nehemiah chapter 3, and I want to talk about your life. And I want to talk about what it means to rebuild your life. Because if I'm honest, in this room, some of you are rebuilding your life right now. Some of you guys are trying to rebuild after something horrific happened to you. Some of you are trying to rebuild after something that you didn't want to go through happened. And so how do we rebuild and what can we gain from Nehemiah chapter 3 for our rebuilding process. You see, in Nehemiah chapter 3, as they're building, they come, upon, they come upon 10 gates that they're working on. And these 10 gates have some symbolism for us today. They symbolize some things for our life. And so when we're rebuilding, I want to look at these 10 gates. Are you guys with me right now? Everyone say amen. Thank you. All right, here we go. The first gate was the sheep gate. The first gate was the sheep gate. I'm going to butcher a bunch of names here. I hope you're ready. The high priest... Eli and his fellow priests began rebuilding the sheep gate. They dedicated and installed its doors. After building the wall to the Tower of the Hundred and the Tower of Hanel, they dedicated it. The men of Jericho built next to Eli and next to them Zakur, son of Emery. That's where they built. So a couple things I want you to note here. In your rebuilding process, if you look at the story of Nehemiah chapter 3, the first thing they started with was the sheep gate, okay? I'm about to blow your minds. I'm glad you're sitting down. But here's what the sheep gate's purpose was, um, <clears throat> to let the sheep in, okay? That's the purpose, all right? I know, that's, that's mind-blowing, all right? You came to church for that. But the idea of this was that they would open up the gate so the sheep could come through. And what the sheep were going to go to was the temple, where they were going to sacrifice them to God for the atonement of sins of the people. Here's, the, here's what I want you to get. In your rebuilding process, what, the, what Nehemiah and his team did, they brought the purpose and the order of worship back to Jerusalem. The first thing they brought back was worship. In your rebuilding process, for some of you that are so down and out, God's calling you instead of trying to figure everything out just to worship, amen? Just to keep pushing forward through God's worship, through worshiping of what he has for you. Worship helps us take our eyes off of our circumstances around us and put them on God. Worship helps us get outside of ourselves and get into the throne room of the Lord. It helps us to not see what we see, but see what God can see. That's what worship is all about. This is why right here in this moment, while we were worshiping just a couple minutes ago, it wasn't just singing fancy, fun songs with an incredible band. It was making war with the Lord to go towards those things that the devil's fighting against us on. Does that make sense to everybody? When you're worshiping, you're doing battle. And the first thing that we have to do is start into worship. When you're rebuilding your life, let's worship. When you're rebuilding everything around you, quit looking at the circumstances and look towards God. The second gate, by the way, there's 10 of these boys. So if you're sitting there thinking, God, we're going to be here till 2 o'clock. Yeah, we are. So get ready. All right. So here we go. The second gate was the fish gate. The fish gate. The sons of Has built the fish gate. They built it with beams and installed its doors, bolts, and bars. It's the fish gate. So the fish gate it is going to blow your mind again. This is where the fishermen would come through. So they would go out, they'd catch all the fish, they'd bring them in, they'd go through this gate. This was known as a really seedy part of the city. This is where people would come in together, commerce was happening, things were happening like that. This for us, this is supposed to symbolize for us the fact that your story isn't useless. 
You know, if you remember in the Gospels, Jesus called the fishermen and he said, hey, I'm going to make you fishers of men. This is going to be for you and I that have went through a tough time, that have went through some struggles. This is going to remind us that your story isn't useless, that your story, the things that you've been through, the tough times that you've walked through, those are going to, your story is going to be used to help someone find freedom. So why we do small groups, why I love small groups, is because you can sit in a circle of people that have went through some of the same things you've went through. The reason why our student ministry is the way it is, we just do small groups, is because we want students to understand that there's another student that's handling what they're handling. There's another person that's done what they've done. They're not alone. It's the same thing for your life. That your story, even though it feels isolated, your story, even though it feels like it's only you, God wants you to know that you're not alone in your story. And that your story can be used to be someone else's survival guide in their life. You're going to bring freedom through your story. Everyone say your story. All right, let's keep going. Number three, number three. We're going to the, to the old gate. The third gate is the old gate. Joe, son of Paz, and Meshulam, son of Bez repaired the old gate. They built it with beams and installed its doors, bolts, and bars. The old gate was the old entrance into Jerusalem. This is how they'd enter in on the north side. The old gate for you and I is going to represent that when you're rebuilding your life, there's going to come a point where you kind of hit a standstill. There's going to come a point where you get a little bit of tension. And the point of the old gate for us is to remember, don't go back to the old ways. Don't turn around and go back to what you were a part of. Don't go back to the things that have been frustrating you. Don't go back to the things that have been consuming you. Don't go back to the old addictions, the old relationships. Don't go back to those things. The old gate represents for you and I that there's a new way forward, but we always want to turn around and go back to what's comfortable. But he's saying go forward. Go get out of the old gate. Get out of the old ways. Don't go back to something God has already given you victory over. It's the old gate. Number four, and we're running through these. Number four, the fourth gate is the valley gate. Everyone say valley gate. Hanun and the inhabitants of Zeno repaired the valley gate. In scripture, valleys represent humility and judgment. Psalm 23, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Valleys are there to remind us, this gate is there to remind us that there's going to be a lot of ups, but there's also going to be a lot of downs in life. But as much as you go up, there's also a way that you're going to go down. And so in the up and in the down, you need Jesus there with you. It's a call to be humble. It's a call to believe that no matter where you've been, no matter what you've been through, that you're not better than anyone else. I don't care what's in your bank account. I don't care how great of kids you've raised. At the end of the day, we're all equal at the foot of the cross. And so the valley is there to remind us to stay humble, to stay where we are. The fifth gate. The fifth gate is the dung gate, Okay. Now, I'm, I am one of the associate pastors here, and so I have to be professional, but I am a youth pastor, and I really want to work on this one for a little bit with you guys, all right, because there's a, there's a lot there. If this was a youth service, we'd stay on that point for four hours, all right? And so, fifth gate is the dung gate. They rebuilt it and installed its doors, bolts, and bars, and repaired 500 yards of the wall to the dung gate. Maldiv, son of Rechab, ruler of the district, of, repaired the dung gate. He rebuilt it and installed its doors, bolts, and bars. This is a really odd name for a very necessary function. This gate would be the gate of elimination. Outside of this gate was the garbage pit. There's actually three valleys that would converge around this spot right here. The garbage pit was a spot where they take all their stuff, they throw it out there, they'd light it on fire. This garbage pit was on fire day and night. The actual name of the garbage pit was this name, Gehenna. That's where we get the word hell. It's kind of the symbol there that you have day and night on fire. It's what that looks like. For us, though, in our rebuilding process in life, when things start to get hard, maybe God's calling some of you to eliminate some things from your life. I, I love going to some of these restaurants now, and they have these limited menus that, that we have. We have limited menus. We were just at a restaurant a couple days ago, and they have a limited menu of what they used to serve. It's just now what they serve here is limited. When you're rebuilding, one of the things you need to look at is who's around you. You see, it's crazy. When you're in good times, you have a lot of friends. When you go through bad times, very few of them. Amen? Loyalty is a big deal. You have a limited amount of people around you. But maybe that's a good thing. Maybe in your own life, when you're rebuilding, maybe you look at what do you need to eliminate. Who are those people that I need to eliminate out of my life? Who are those people? What are those things that I need to get away from to help me to move 
forward. This gate is also a place where we live open-handed with God. And when I say open hand, here's what I mean. There, there's a part of us that we're like, God, you can have everything. And so we open our hands to God, but we just kind of hold one of them back. God, you can have everything, but just don't take that from me. God, you can have everything, but don't, don't ask me about what's in my wallet. God, you can have everything, but don't, don't ask me to, to, to quit sleeping with my girlfriend. God, 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 you can have everything, but don't, don't ask me to quit doing that. But here's the truth. God is always, if he loves you, He's always going to ask you what's in your other hand. Because he wants to bring you freedom. And holding things from God isn't freedom. God can't be your Savior, not the Lord also. He has to be the Savior and the Lord of your life. It's not one or the other. You don't hold things back from him. He wants to bring you freedom. And there's freedom in giving it all to the Lord. Amen? The sixth gate is the fountain gate. Everyone say fountain gate. Verse 15, Shalun, son of, ruler of the district of Mizpah, repaired the fountain gate. He rebuilt it and roofed it, then, reinst- then installed its doors, bolts, and bars. This is actually the spot where Jesus was healing the lame man. If you remember the story in the New Testament, the lame man that wanted to crawl into the pool of Siloam to be healed, this is kind of in that same exact area. The fountain gate is where the water begins to flow into Jerusalem. It went through what they called the Hezekiah Tunnel, and they called it living water in that time. The living water flowed through that, flowed through that, through those tunnels into Jerusalem. For us today, in a rebuilding process, water represents the Holy Spirit's power in our life. You don't need to walk anywhere without the Holy Spirit. You don't want to make any directions. You don't want to make any decisions without the Holy Spirit, without the living water in your life. The Holy Spirit is there to guide you and to protect you. The Holy Spirit isn't interested in your talent. He's not really interested in the facade you put on here at church or what you put on Facebook. He's interested in willing people saying, God, use me no matter what. That's the fountain gate. The seventh gate is the water gate. Verse 26 says it like this, the temple servants lived on Ophel and they made repairs opposite the water gate towards the east and the tower that juts out. Water represents the word of God. When it comes time to rebuild your life, here's my, here's my call to you, rebuild on the word of God. Don't rebuild on your own foundation, rebuild on the word of God. You know what's crazy about this verse is the water gate didn't need any kind of repair. It wasn't looking for repair. And here's what it kind of symbolizes for you and I, the word of God doesn't need repair. The word of God doesn't need to be perfected. The word of God needs to be re-inhabited. And oh, that we'd be a church that cared about the word of God. Oh, that you would be a family that cared about the word of God. Oh, that I would be a person that cared about the word of God. The Bible says that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Let's live as people of the word. The, la- the next one is the eighth gate. The eighth gate is the horse gate. Verse 28, each of the priests made repairs above the horse gate, each opposite his own house. See, in the biblical times, donkeys were the form of transportation. Like, when you think about it, you think, man, they all rode around on horses. No, they rode on donkeys. If you remember the story of Passion Week, when Jesus went into Jerusalem, what was he riding on? Do you guys remember? A donkey. He's, he's riding a donkey in. This is, this is what this means. See, a, a horse was a, a symbol of battle in those times, a symbol of war. What it's supposed to remind us of is when we're rebuilding in life, you need to understand that you're going, to come apro- you're going to come across oppression. You're going to come across spiritual warfare. You're going to come across things that don't make sense because the devil doesn't want you in victory. I love the verse in the New Testament, in the book of Luke. Where Jesus tells him, before you want to follow me, you really need to count the cost. The idea there, what he's trying to tell you, is in those times, there'd be a king with a giant army and a king with a smaller army. And the kings would come together, and the king with the giant army would look at the king with the smaller army and say, hey, before we go to war here, you should count the cost. Before this happens, before we go, I'm going to destroy you, but you need to count the cost before you really want to take this step. Life with Christ is not easy. It's tough. There are things that you're always going to come against. But the promise is still that greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Amen? The ninth gate is the east gate. The east gate. Verse 29. And this is like my favorite one of them. Verse 29. After them, Zadok, son of Immer, made repairs opposite his house 
and beside him Shemaiah son of Shekinah, I don't know, guard of the east gate, made repairs. This is, again, is my favorite gate of them all. The ninth gate is the best one for me because, man, there's so much symbolism here. There's so much power here. Jewish people believe that the Messiah would walk through this gate. We as Christians believe that when Jesus comes back, he's going to go through this gate. I love, we just talked about it a second ago, but the Passion Week, Jesus rode on the donkey through this gate. There's so much here to see. Just opposite, by the way, of the East Gate is the Mount of Olives. And this is where the high priest would stand, and the high priest would stand there, and he would look through the East Gate into the temple, into the Holy of Holies, where God's presence was supposed to be, where the forgiveness of sin was supposed to be. There's so much in this place. There's so much through the East Gate. And why this gate is important for us in our rebuilding process, why this is important for the people of Jerusalem, of Nehemiah's time, is because this gate can give us hope. And the hope is this. The hope is not in you figuring out your situation. The hope is not you getting forgiveness in your heart. The hope isn't in some idea of maybe one day you'll be out of the situation you're in. The hope is in this, that we have a God who still serves. We have a God who still sits on his throne. That's the hope. And that that God is still coming back one day to see us. That that God is going to pull up his church, bring them up into heaven. That all of this stuff around us, this coronavirus, this pandemic, this pain, this loss, one day it's going to be gone. One day it's not going to be there anymore. Your depression, your anxiety, your hurt, it will be wiped away completely. There will be no more death. There will be no more pain because he stands on a throne and his promise to you is that he's coming back. I love that. It's hope. That your hope isn't in Joe Biden. Your hope isn't in Donald Trump. Your hope isn't in a vaccine or a mask. Your hope is in a king and a kingdom love that because he's coming back he says I'm, I'm gonna go away to prepare the mansion but I'm gonna come back for you that's a powerful powerful scripture and it's through the east gate the, the ninth gate and the last one here is the tenth gate it's the inspection gate everyone say inspection <coughs> verse 31 next to him Mount one of the goldsmiths made repairs to the house of the temple servants of the merchants opposite the inspection gate and as far as the upstairs room on the corner the inspection gate is where they would check the animals as they were coming in where they checked the trade of people what they were bringing in here's what the inspection gate is for you and I as you're rebuilding your life you start out with worship you move on to realize that God can use your story that you have hope the inspection gate is always this that we just need to look over our lives again what's out of line with the Lord what am I doing that I know God isn't calling me to do? What am I doing that I know isn't pleasing to the Lord? What's God called me to do that I'm not following through with? I don't want to harp on this point. But if I'm just blunt, level honest with you, some of you guys in this room, God's called you to be a small group leader. Some of you guys in this room, God's called you to lead a group of people and you're just not going to do it. I'm too busy. I have too much going on. But maybe through your leadership, we can see people really truly find freedom. I don't want to make your schedule busier. I'm not trying to hit you and make you have a bunch more stuff to do. I'm just telling you, God could use your talents, your leadership to change someone's life. When I've talked to so many of you guys, I said, man, I know God, I know God wants me to lead a small group, but just not now. I need you now. I do. How do you gather people together in a time where it's hard to gather? I, I don't know the complete answer to that, but here's, here, here's what I do know. God's called us community. And community, by the way, is not just this right here. It's just not. Community is living life together, growing together. So I need you. I need some small group leaders. I need some of you guys to say, hey, even though I know my life is busy, I'm going to take that step. I'm going to get into a small group. I'm going to join in with other people. Next week, you're going to have the opportunity to do that. We have so many small groups for you. So many good small groups for me to pick from. Like I said, Colby and Christina, they're leading a group for new people to Hill Spring Church. If you've been here six months, one year, whatever it looks like, join into that group. Maybe you want to learn how to teach the Bible, learn how to read the Bible. 
There's groups like that. Maybe, maybe you're a, a sub-30 person that you want to, you don't have anyone in this church to really connect you. You're not in the youth ministry. You're really not in a married couple. So you just got to find, we have groups for that. Don't give up. Find your community. And so I want to end like this. This whole morning we were talking about rebuilding. We are talking about gates and how you rebuild your life. God didn't bring the Israelites back home to rebuild a wall. He brought them back home to rebuild their identity. Don't waste the season that you're in. Don't waste this rebuilding season. No matter what you've walked through, your failure isn't final. You're not without hope. Jesus was crucified outside of the Jerusalem wall so he could welcome you inside of them. Hey, thanks for watching this sermon on the Hillspring YouTube page. If you enjoyed it, take just a second, hit that subscribe button. That way you won't miss a single video. For more information about Hillspring, visit our website at hillspring.tv for times and location. We hope your faith was lifted and your life has been inspired with this message. Thanks again for watching.